Notes receivable are assets like accounts receivable, but notes receivable are more formal than accounts receivable. Accounts receivable result from trade sales you make with your customers. You sell some things to them, they pay you. Sell more things, they pay you. It's an open arrangement, it's a very fluid arrangement. Whereas the note receivable is a much more formal asset. We're going to have a written agreement signed by both the borrower and the lender. There are going to be, usually be interest uh, payments associated with this. I mean, after all, I like to think about interest as rent, really. If you borrow money from somebody, you're renting their money. In this case, if you are the lender and you lend money to somebody, you are allowing them to rent your money. And the last time I rented something, I had to make a payment for it. So there's usually interest associated with a note receivable. There's going to be a maturity date. There are going to be repayment terms. There are going to be covenants. Okay? Covenants is probably a new term for you. Uh, when a borrower makes a covenant in the written agreement uh, or covenants, what they're basically doing is they're saying that they will do certain things that protect the lender. For example, the borrower might have a covenant that says, we will maintain a current ratio of at least 1.5, or we will maintain a, uh, a minimum tangible net worth, or a minimum retained earnings balance, or it could be any number of things designed to protect the creditor, okay, uh, the, the lender in this case. And, you know, there's also going to be terms of default. In other words, what if the borrower does not pay in full or does not pay in a timely manner. Can they come take your car? Can they take your house? Can they take your kids? Okay, probably not your kids, but you get the point. So let's explore just a, a simple example of a note receivable. And, you know, on its surface, not incredibly complicated, um, but we get these little nuances when a note spans two different reporting periods. Because look what's happening here, okay? November 1 is the inception of our note, okay? In other words, we're going to lend some money to somebody on November 1. And this is a 12-month note. Two of those months will occur in the 2018 year. Ten of them will occur in 2019, because November, December, and then over here we have January through October. So we get all the way over here to Halloween of the next year, and... That's the maturity date of this particular loan, okay? So let's just talk about this loan for a minute. The principal amount is going to be $100,000. That's one of the key terms, okay? That's the amount that we are lending to somebody. The maturity date, as we talked about, is going to be Halloween of 2019. And principal and accrued interest will be repaid at maturity. Now, that might be a little different than what you've seen with some loans because some of you may have mortgages, maybe you've had a car payment. And when you have a mortgage or you have a car loan, each time you make a payment to the lender in a fully amortizing loan, a portion of that payment represents principal, okay? You owe less after you make that payment, and a portion of that payment represent it, represents interest. But companies can get very creative with the way they structure loans uh, with other financing arrangements. So in this case, what we're basically saying is, hey, we will loan you $100,000 on November 1, 2018. And then you don't have to pay us a dime until we get all the way over here to Halloween of the next year. And oh, by the, by the way, this is another important part of it. The annual interest rate is 6%. And it's important to note that that's annual, okay? If that were monthly, 6% per month would be a 72% annual interest rate. I don't think we're gonna have any predatory lending practices like that here. So let's do the journal entry on November 1. What does this journal entry look like? We're going to debit notes receivable for 100,000. Remember, we, we are the lender and we're gonna credit cash $100,000. So this is what the journal entry would look like. Now, of course, we would post these to the T accounts, uh, notes receivable in cash, but we're just gonna keep it simple with the journal entry right here. And notice what's happening here. If you take a look at the fundamental accounting equation down here, you have assets going up by 100,000, but then you have assets going down 
by 100,000. And nothing is happening over here with liabilities or with stockholders' equity. So the initial loan is simply trading one asset for another. Cash goes down, notes receivable goes up. Albeit, cash is a more liquid asset than notes receivable. So we have somewhat impaired our company's liquidity because we've traded a very liquid asset for one that is less liquid. In other words, if we need money to pay our bills, suddenly we don't have that cash available. Hopefully we have other stores of cash, other resources. Uh, but in order to convert this asset right here to cash, we're going to need to collect it from the borrower. And that could be difficult. That could take time. There's certainly some risk. But the net effect here, assets are up by 100, down by 100. Net effect is zero. Nothing affects liabilities and stockholders' equity, at least at this point in time. Here's where the complication starts to come into play. And it's a cruel accounting. But the reality is a cruel accounting tries to measure what occurred during a particular time period. Now, we get to the end of 2018 when the ball drops on New Year's Eve and the reality is the borrower has borrowed our money. They've rented our money for two full months at this point, okay? Right. So they've rented it for two months and we need to capture the economic effects of that transaction. So we have a fundamental formula here, okay? Interest is going to be equal to principal times rate times time. Now, in this case, the, uh, the principal is $100,000, and the rate is 6%. Now, if you want to express it as 0 0.06, you could do that. Um, if you want to write 6%, that's fine, too. But now time, 2 twelfths. Why? Well, this interest rate is 6% per year. That's the same as 6% for 12 months. So... The period of time that has elapsed here is two months. So we're measuring what is the interest, what is the rent for that period of time. And if you do the math on this, you'll find it's a thousand bucks. Now, then what we have to do is on December 31, we need to memorialize the fact that we have a new asset. It's called interest receivable. All right. That'll keep me writing for just a minute here, for a hot minute. Um, interest receivable is $1,000. And then we have interest revenue, which is $1,000. And once I get done writing that, I just want to talk about those two accounts for just a moment. Okay? See, interest receivable is an asset on the balance sheet. And in fact, it's a current asset on the balance sheet because we expect that to be converted to cash within the next 12 months. And in fact, we expect to receive this $1,000 of interest on Halloween when this loan matures, okay? The interest revenue is an other income account on the income statement for 2018 because you see what we have to measure is this. We've earned two months worth of revenue. It's $1,000 worth of revenue and that belongs on our 2018 income statement. That's why we're making a credit to interest revenue. Revenues go up with a credit. However, we did not receive cash. So we can't debit cash. We didn't receive the cash. We have a promise to pay cash. That's where our current asset and accrual accounting allows us to accomplish this. We can record the transaction on the income statement and also on the balance sheet without affecting the cash account because we just did not receive the cash yet. Now, what I'd like to point out is this. Now, this isn't necessarily the textbook way of doing it, but it's, it's a way of doing this. Think about it this way. So if this loan were to, uh, you know, for, for the full term of the loan, the 12 months, it's a 6% interest rate, and that is $6,000 of interest per year. Now, I purposely made these numbers pretty simple. So if the interest is $6,000, for an entire 12 month period, okay? Even though it spans two different fiscal years, what you can do is you can look at it this way. $6,000 for 12 months divided by 12 months comes out to $500 per month. 
And yes, this is simple interest. It's not the effective interest method. We're just keeping things simple with the concept because really the biggest concept is this one right here that we're trying to measure the amount of interest earned during this period of time versus the amount of interest earned during this period of time. And if we can measure that at a rate of $500 per month in this example, you can very quickly see that interest earned in November was $500 and in December was $500. That's your $1,000 in the income statement. It's in a receivable, but as you'll see in a few minutes, when we get to Halloween, we're gonna get that $1,000. So this $1,000 right here, let's kind of look at what that did when we recorded that journal entry. That caused our assets to increase by $1,000 because this current asset called interest receivable increased. Nothing happened over here with liabilities, but stockholders equity ultimately did increase by $1,000 because other income increased. That's, it's not, it's like revenue because it makes our profit bigger, but it's not revenue with customers, it's revenue from another source. In this case, an investment that we made in a note receivable. So what you're seeing is this, the company is slightly more valuable and the stockholders of the company have slightly more equity because we would have seen a higher net income for 2018 as a result of the interest revenue and that is manifesting itself in a higher retained earnings over here and a higher interest receivable balance as a current asset. Now we need to measure the interest for these 10 months. Just as a reminder, okay, remember, for the entire loan, the interest is $6,000. We looked at that a few minutes ago. And we had recorded $1,000 of that revenue during 2018. The other 5,000 of revenue is gonna be recorded during the 2019 fiscal year. And that makes sense because we loaned our money out for five times as long, you know, interest, accrues with the passage of time. So what we're seeing here is, what's the interest? Well, it's $100,000. That's our principal. The rate is 6%. Whether you do it as 0.06 or 6%, I would probably do 0.06, but you're getting the concept here. And then now, the fraction of time is 10 twelfths. That's where this 5,000 is coming from. Of course, you can look at it this way too. Remember how we came up with that real round $500 per month? $500 per month times 10 months, that's $5,000. So what you're seeing is 1,000 of the revenue recorded in 18, 5,000 of the revenue recorded in 19, and as far as I can tell, the maturity date is over here at 10:31, 19, Happy Halloween, let's record this payment. Halloween brings us trick or treat. In this case, it's treat, okay, because we got paid in full. So the, the, the question is this, way over here at the maturity date, we're supposed to receive a payment that includes principal and interest. So let's construct the journal entry, okay? What that means, and sometimes you'll see in textbooks where they will they'll create two different entries to record this, and that's fine. Uh, I just kind of, I, I like the succinctness of putting it all in one spot here. So if we're gonna get repaid principal plus interest, that's $106,000. Remember, we had loaned $100,000 to that company. They're supposed to pay us back on Halloween with $6,000 of interest. So we're gonna get a check for $106,000, or maybe it's a PayPal or a Venmo or something like that. But we're going to get the money. Now, that's an asset increasing with a debit. The note receivable goes away, okay? Whether we have multiple or one, but notes receivable is an asset that is going to decrease. Remember, the initial entry to record this was a debit to notes receivable. Now that asset is going away, so we record it with a credit. The interest receivable that we had recorded at the end of 2018 that goes away because we're getting paid and then finally interest revenue on the 2019 income statement gets recorded 
and this journal entry balances out. Because you see, this is an asset increase in the balance sheet. These are two assets decreasing in the balance sheet. And this revenue is going to be reported on the current income statement. Journal entry balances, our debits are 106. These credits total out to 106. We know that uh, debits have to equal credits. So let's see how this affects the accounting equation. I need to make a little bit of real estate available on the board here, but you can hang with me. Because what you're seeing is the assets are increasing by $106,000. And that's solely because of the cash right here. But then also the assets are decreasing by 101,000 because these receivables are going away, right? Now you might say, well, yep, that's a net increase of $5,000 in assets. Assets, totally agree. So here's a $5,000 increase in assets. Well, nothing's happening with liabilities, but just like we saw in 2018, stockholders' equity will increase because of this interest revenue. Now, it's a bigger increase, but it's the same concept. Interest revenue causes net income to be higher for the 2019 income statement. That will cause retained earnings to be bigger on the October 31 balance sheet. And what we are ultimately seeing is stockholders have greater value because this interest was earned. And in fact, in this case, it was actually paid too. So you see what we've done is we've taken the economic effects of a 12 month loan that spans two different accounting periods, two months in one year, 10 months in the other year. And we've used accrual accounting, in this case, interest receivable, to be able to measure the economic impact on the income statement for each of those particular years.